Okay, um, welcome everybody to the Asia Pacific Analysis and PDE seminar. It's uh, today my great pleasure to introduce Daniel Spector from the um, Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology Graduate University in Japan. Uh, Daniel obtained his PhD in 2011 at the Carnegie Mellon University in the United States under the supervision of Giovanni Loni. He wrote a wonderful book about BV function and Sobolev spaces, uh, Professor Giovanni, I mean, <laughs> Leone. After his PhD, uh, Daniel was appointed as distinguished assistant professor at uh, Zeyang University in Hangzhou. And from 2012 until 2014, he was postdoctoral scholar at the Technion University in Haifa. And from 2014 until 2019, uh, uh, he was appointed as assistant professor at the National Chiao Tung University in Xinchu, Taiwan, where he was promoted and later also as associate professor. And since 2019, Daniel is appointed as associate professor at OIST. So thank you, Daniel. I met you in Haifa last year and it was a great pleasure. The discussion was not mathematical, but uh, I was reading your papers uh, over the time. And that's the reason why you was one of my favorite lists to ask whether you could speak in this uh, international seminar. And uh, yeah, so please start. You will speak about optimal Lorentz estimates and the difficult systems. That's correct. Thank you very much for the, the nice introduction, Daniel, and, uh, and also for this invitation. So um, I have not been to one of these seminars before. But let me begin and talk about, uh, as a joke of my colleague, Emile Toubert, about the, the high technology that I'll be using for this talk. This is the future of, uh, of mathematics we have here. Um, so uh, it's nice to be here with all of you. And uh, the other thing is uh, the social distancing. I'm glad that you know, we're here in this big room, but we're also quite far away from each other. So we don't have to worry about coronavirus right now. OK. so. Today, I'm going to speak about optimal Lorentz estimates for div curl systems. And uh, this is uh, based on a joint work with Felipe Hernandez, who's at Stanford. And uh, if you're interested after the talk, you can find more information in the paper, which is available on the archive. And here's the identifier. So let's, uh, let's get into it. The problem that we're interested in is that of finding estimates for Z, which satisfies curl z is equal to f, and divergence z is equal to 0. And uh, such systems arise, for example, in the study of electricity and magnetism, for example, in Maxwell's equations. So in, uh, in that setting, we have that z, which is often written as b, this is a mapping from R3 into R3. And this is the magnetic field. And there, uh, F is often written as J. This is also a mapping from R3 to R3. This is the electric current density. And uh, these are just the equations for the magnetic field, of course, in Maxwell's equations, it's coupled with the equations for the electric field. The curl of E is equal to zero, and the divergence of E is equal to rho. And E is then the electric field. It's a mapping from R3 to R3. And rho is a mapping from R3 to R is scalar, is the electric charge density. So what do these equations describe? So the curl of Z is equal to F. So in the case where you're thinking about electricity and magnetism, if you run a current through a wire in some direction, and we're not going to worry about the, uh, the orientation, about precisely what's going on with the electrons. But if you run current through a wire, then it generates a magnetic field in an orthogonal direction. So it generates a rotational field of, of the magnetic field. And that's what this first equation expresses. 
The second equation, that the divergence of z is equal to zero, the divergence of the magnetic field is equal to zero, this reflects the fact that if you take any region, and if you look at, there's the normal on the region, so the normal is just pointing, say the outward unit normal here, and then if we get another color here for the, oh, green's not gonna be good, let's go with yellow, get another color here for the, uh, the magnetic field, so say the magnetic field is coming and it's, you have magnets which are, which are going this way, and they're going this way, so the magnetic field, you can imagine there's magnets going, going from, you know, going across this, uh, this region, that when you look at the integral over the boundary of any one of these regions of the magnetic field dotted with the normal, that this is equal to zero. That's what this equation expresses right here. So if this is B or if this is, is Z, this is what this means. And what this expresses is the fact that you don't have any magnetic monopoles. There's no concentration of magnetism at, at a point in the region. The uh, third equation, curl E equals zero, says that E is the gradient of some scalar. And the divergence of E is equal to rho, says that for the electric field, if you consider the corresponding quantity, you could have electricity going through a region. It could come in from this side, could go out this side, but actually electricity can concentrate. You can have point charges in a region. And um, I said we're interested in the problem of finding estimates, and that's because classically, we already have an explicit solution to this equation. So classically, we already know that if we write down Z is the curl of I2F, where I2 is the inverse of the Laplacian. So I2 minus the Laplacian of I2 phi is equal to phi, say, whenever phi is smooth and compactly supported. Then we can write down Z is equal to the curl of I2F will be an explicit solution of these equations. And this is nothing other than the Helmholtz decomposition. So you can write it as a, a curl and then a, a gradient of a divergence. But in the case where you're divergence free, all you recover is that Z is the curl of I2 of F. And the point is, is that there's a lot of things with such a representation that could be said classically. Classically, if you look at this, if Z is the curl of I2 F, you can write down some estimates for the gradient of Z in LP. The gradient of Z in LP is one derivative of Z, and so it's one derivative of, so it's a gradient of the curl of I2 of F, and so we have the gradient and the curl. We can, we can only get bigger point-wise by going up by the whole Hessian of I2 F in LP, so this is a point-wise inequality. Now this is two derivatives, and this is two integrals. Uh, when you take two derivatives of two integrals, it, it doesn't recover the identity because this inverts the Laplacian, but two derivatives of two integrals is a zeroth order operator. This is a singular integral operator, it's a calderon zeigmann operator, and so what you can do is you can get boundedness for some c that depends on p times f and lp, provided one is less than p is less than plus infinity. And this means that if you look at Z in LP star, then P star should be the Sobolev embedding exponent associated to the fact that you have a P here and you're in three dimensions. So it's 3P over 3 minus P. And the Sobolev embedding says that Z in LP star can be controlled by the gradient of Z in LP, which by this inequality says that you can get controlled by uh, C, P, F, and L, P, and so there's one constant here and another constant there, so you get some new constant times the right-hand side F and L, P. And going through this inequality means that while you can recover the case P equals 1 in the, in the Gallardo-Nuremberg embedding, you have to say P is strictly bigger than 1 to go through this inequality. So the second inequality holds for P, which is strictly bigger than 1 and strictly less than 3. While the top inequality is false in the, uh, in the regime P equals one, it was a surprising discovery of Morgana Brazis that this second inequality persists in the, uh, in the case P equals one. And this is very important because if you look at our example we're thinking about, electricity and magnetism, 
uh, you want an estimate with F in LP, F is J, and the most natural assumption is that the integral of J to the first power is finite. Because the integral of J to the first power, J is the electric uh, current density, so if you integrate it, you get the total electric current being finite. Of course, you can assume this is an LP, maybe L2 makes sense for some reason, but this is a natural physical assumption to impose on the system, and so this is the most natural assu assumption. And so the fact that this actually holds when P equals one, which is due to Morgan and Brazis, which I will mention more about this, so forgive me for writing a little bit small here, in uh, 2004, uh, this is quite surprising. This is quite surprising. So the origins of the discovery of this inequality in the case P equals one is, uh, is a paper of Morgana Brazis, actually joint with Petromir and Eskew. So before the 2004 paper, in 1998, so this is Morgan, Brazis, Miranescu, they prove the following inequality. If gamma contained in R3 is a smooth closed curve, oriented by its tangent, call its tangent gamma dot. So gamma is a parameterization of capital gamma and gamma dot is, uh, is the unit tangent. Then there exists a constant greater than zero such that the integral of a test function along this curve So you integrate a test function along this curve with respect to the Hausdorff measure, the one-dimensional Hausdorff measure on the curve. This can be controlled by a constant times the derivative of the test function, the gradient, in L3. Here we're in three dimensions, so that's the significance of three here, times the length of the curve, gamma. So you look at this, and you look at this other inequality here, and it's not obvious immediately that these two are actually related. And um, the connection of this inequality with the inequality that I, I uh, have written here and the 2004 paper, this is found as a consequence of result of Smirnov. So result of Smirnov, not directly, but you can use it to argue that given one of these divergence-free vector fields, you can realize it as a weak limit, so a limit in, uh, what am I writing here? Limit as L goes to infinity of the sum of i equals one to some n sub l of some alpha i's times gamma dot h1 restricted to so gamma i gamma i uh, so you can write any divergence free function as a weak limit of convex combinations of these, so let me draw one of these gamma. So gamma is a closed loop oriented by its tangent gamma dot. This is gamma, this is the parameterization, and this is the unit tangent. Any divergence-free field can be written first. You take finite sums of convex combinations of, uh, of loops, and then you look at the limit of such sums. And so I should put another thing here. This alpha i depends on also on L. So as L goes to infinity, the number of loops goes to infinity, the loops change a little bit, and the coefficients change a little bit. That's the first thing. And the second thing is that actually this weak star limit is a little bit stronger. It approximates it in the strict topology in the sense that actually the total variation of F, so F as a measure or F in L1, so let's say as a measure on our D, uh, R3 here, this is actually equal to the limit as L goes to infinity of the sum I equals one to N sub L of alpha I L times gamma I L the lengths. 
so that not only do you get weak star approximation of the function, but actually you get convergence of the total variation of these, which is just the length times these constants, is converging to this total variation. So how does that imply the preceding inequality? Well, if you start with an F, you can write it as this limit and then you use subadditivity here and you apply the inequality to each one of these curves. And then on the right hand side, what you collect together is you get the gradient of Y and you get the sum of each of the gamma I's with the coefficients, which then the limit here is converging to this limit. So once you've established it for closed loops, then that's the whole story to get uh, an inequality, which is the same inequality where this is replaced by a divergence free function. So what you obtain is you obtain the following inequality. You obtain that the integral over of y dotted with your divergence free function can be controlled by the gradient of y in L3 times F in L1. That's what you can obtain as a result of this, uh, this approximation. And we still have to actually make a connection because you still look at this and you say, no, I don't see the connection with the last inequality. Actually, this inequality is just dual to the preceding inequality. And uh, because it's going to be useful for my purposes, let me just show you one way to, to approach this duality and one way in which this implies the preceding inequality. And the way to do it, or one way to do it, I should say, is to look at the gradient of y. That's one derivative of y. And you can see this as the Riesz transform of half a Laplacian of y. So you can check this using just the Fourier transform. This is one derivative and one derivative, and they differ by this singular integral operator. And this is a classical uh, work of calderon Zygmunt that brings us this. And the second thing is that y, uh, you can express it in terms of half a, half a Laplacian. Of course, if you take one derivative, then you have to take one integral. And so you can write this as I1 of half a Laplacian of y. And here, let me define, as will be useful in the future, let me define this I alpha, say, acting on y here. So it can act on scalars, it can act on vectors. I alpha is the Riesz potential of order alpha. So alpha over 2, the gamma function of alpha over 2, an integral of t to the alpha over 2 minus 1, pt, where pt is the heat kernel, convolve with y and dt. So by taking the heat kernel, you can integrate the heat kernel with respect to some power t to the alpha over 2 minus 1, and you can get these Riesz potentials. And then you look at the case where I've used this notation I alpha. You look at the case of I2 that we introduced before, I2 of phi. We want I2 of phi to satisfy the same equation that we'd had on the last four, that we want this to actually be the Newtonian potential, the inverse of the Laplacian. You plug in alpha equals 2 here. 2 over 2 is 1 minus 1 is 0, and you see that uh, this is just 1 over gamma of 1, so it's, uh, it's 1 there. Gamma of 1 is 0 factorial is 1. So you just integrate the heat kernel convolved with y. So if you take the Laplacian of the left-hand side when alpha equals 2, and you take the Laplacian or minus the Laplacian of the right-hand side, minus the Laplacian of the heat kernel is minus d by dt of the heat kernel because the Laplacian uh, can be turned into a derivative in time because this satisfies the heat equation. It satisfies the heat equation, so you get this d by dt, but this is just the fundamental theorem of calculus. Minus d by dt integrated from zero to infinity gives you the value of this at zero, but this is an approximation of the identity. So you catch y back at zero, and at infinity, the heat kernel decays, and so it goes to zero. So you can actually see from this formula that this satisfies, that for i2 you satisfy this, but in general, you have these now, these integral operators that are going to be useful for us to talk about in the future. So for this inequality right here, you use the second formula to introduce over here. So we're going to introduce, so here we're integrating in R3. We're going to introduce half a Laplacian of y. And we have the I1, which we can move across here by Fubini. We're going to use the boundedness, the Riesz transforms. And so between using this formula on this side, using this identity on the right-hand side, and using the boundedness of this singular integral operator on L3, 
we get this inequality that I one F dotted with something, with something can be controlled by the L3 norm of that something times the L1 norm of F. But then you take the L3 norm and you move it over to the left-hand side and you say, I want F dotted with something in L3 and I take the supremum over those somethings. And these things are dense in, in L3. So what you get is the norm of I one F in the dual space. You get the norm of I one F in the dual of L3, which is L3 halves, can be controlled by F in L1. And here you've used the fact that the divergence of F is zero. So this establishes this inequality. And to go from this inequality to the inequality of Morgan and Brazis, the last step is we start with Z. Z is the curl of I2F, same space, L3 halves. So let me, let me pay attention to the size here at the bottom. Let me come here a second. So let me write here, I1F in L3 halves is less than a constant times F in L1 whenever the divergence of F is zero. So that if we start trying to estimate Z in L3 halves, this is equal to the curl of I2 of F, that's just what Z is in L3 halves. This is one derivative and two integrals. We can take this I2 and we can write it as I1 and I1. So we can separate, it's a semi-group property. So the curl of I1 is one derivative and one integral is another singular integral operator so by the boundedness of singular integral operators, we can get this control by I1F in L3 halves. And now this constant depends upon the bound for the singular integral operator, which is in LP where P is three halves. And so of course it's bounded, we're away from one. And finally, I1F by this inequality is controlled by F in L1 because the divergence of F is equal to zero. And you put these together and you see that Z and L3 halves can be controlled by a constant times F and L1, which is the endpoint P equals one of the inequality that I previously showed you. And of course, what this reflects is if we get good estimates for integral operators, we can translate this into good estimates for PDE, which is not surprising. Now this 2004 announcement of this result and some, some other results and a 2007 GEMS paper that followed it up with the details of the argument, they served as a catalyst for a great number of papers. Let me mention a few. Let me mention a few. So there's work by Jean von Schaftigen. Now he gave a simple proof of this inequality. And in fact, he characterized the differential operators for which such estimates can hold. So you have this fractional integration theorem right here for divergence f equals zero. But you could think about other differential constraints on that. You could think about curl f equals zero or some pick your favorite differential operator f equals zero. He gave necessary and sufficient conditions on the differential operator for which you can support such an inequality, the so-called co-canceling condition. Uh, there's work by Loredana Lanzani and Elias Stein which uh, handled the case of differential forms. Differential forms is also uh, approached in the later bourguin brazis paper. There's work by Pierre Bousquet. Petru Mirinescu. And Emmanuel Russ. This gave a streamlined argument and also treated various function spaces beyond what uh, Bourguin and Brazis had treated. Sagun Chenio and Polam Young, they proved some improved strict heart estimates and application to fluid mechanics and electricity and magnetism. Of course, I've already mentioned electricity and magnetism, but they had treated some of these cases, including, I believe, the, uh, the not static case, so the dynamic case. Uh, Pierre Bousquet, Emmanuel Russ, Paul Amyang and Yi Wang, who had treated the higher order case 
And, uh, and this is just a, a brief synopsis that if I had more time to, well, if we're gonna go into all the literature, this would be even another seminar to go through. But there was still, through all of these references that I've mentioned and the one that I haven't mentioned, there was a lingering question from the 2007 paper of Borgan and Brazis. So the lingering question, say open question, And that question is, does Z, which satisfies this equation, uh, admit the estimate Z in the Lorentz space, L3 halves comma one can be controlled by constant times F in L1. And of course, this is the title of the talk, Optimal Lorentz Estimates for, uh, for Some Div Curl Systems. This is the question that they asked in 2007. After they asked this question, one could observe that the same result for Q with Q strictly bigger than one can be deduced from a result of von Schaftigen. So if Q is bigger than one, you can get an estimate uh, in the Lorentz space L3 halves comma Q is bounded by some CQ times F in L1. And this constant CQ blows up as Q goes to one. So this estimate is not stable in the limit as Q goes to one. And uh, this question from 2007, it remained unanswered until, uh, until this year. And uh, we're gonna give a, an affirmative answer to this question as a consequence of the following theorem. So this theorem, Felipe Hernandez, myself, is here. Let D bigger than or equal to two. So if you're in two or more dimensions and alpha, is some number between zero and D. Then there exists a constant C, which depends upon alpha and the dimension, which is bigger than zero, such that I alpha F in L D over D minus alpha comma one can be controlled by a constant times F in L one for all F and L1 such that the divergence of F is equal to zero. If D is bigger than two and alpha is a number between zero and D, then you can find a constant such that the Reese potential acting on F in the appropriately scaling space, uh, L D over D minus alpha comma one, the sharp Lorentz estimate, can be controlled by a constant times F in L1 whenever the divergence of F equals zero. So first, to make the connection between the open question and the theorem. Actually, the connection between the open question and the theorem is exactly what I have written right here, and I'll, I'll repeat again, that if you start with Z in L3 halves comma one, instead of L3 halves, the same boundedness of singular integral operators on the LP spaces it applies on Lorentz spaces. So this could be controlled by a constant times I1F in the Lorentz space, L3 halves comma one. So then if you have this theorem here, in the case that D equals three and alpha equals one and F is divergence free, then you find that this controls, is controlled by F and L1 and that establishes the, uh, the conjecture or open question of, of Borgan and Brzees. So um, having established that this fractional integration theorem will answer the question of Borgan and Brzees, I'd like to spend the rest of the talk giving you a uh, sketch of the proof of the theorem. So how does it go? Okay, this is sketch of the proof. The first thing 
is that by Smirnov's approximation, I claim it suffices to check the estimate, which is the estimate that we want, d over d minus alpha comma one, to check it on, on closed loops gamma. So if we can establish this result for closed loops, then we can take any f, which is divergence free, and we can make the weak star approximation by uh, limits of sums of convex combination of, of convex combinations of these, apply the estimate to each of them, and then Smirnov's approximation will give that on the right hand side we can recover the norm of f. So the same argument as how you pass from the um, the inequality of uh, Borgan, Brzezis, and Marinescu to the uh, the version involving f, you can do it. So that's the first uh, the first step. And I claim that we only need to handle the case alpha in zero one. We only need to handle the case where the norm of gamma or the length of gamma is one. So gamma has unit length. And we only need to handle the case where, let me just move these up a little bit. So alpha in zero one, length of gamma is one. And the soup over t bigger than zero of t to the d minus one over two, pt convolved with this loop, h gamma dot h1 restricted to gamma, is bounded by some universal constant c. So why does it suffice to make these three further uh, assumptions? First of all, if we can prove it for any alpha bigger than zero, this is going to imply it for all the bigger values of alpha, all the larger values of alpha, because we can use the semi-group property of the Reese potentials, and we can use the fact that you have standard convolution inequalities once you get away from the L1 endpoint. So all you need to do is for some value of alpha, and we can do it for all the alpha in zero, one. And that'll get from one all the way up to the dimension. The second thing is, why can we, does it suffice to consider the case where the length of gamma is equal to one? Well, this inequality, if you take and you dilate gamma, then you can reduce the dependence on the, on the length of gamma. So by dilation, it suffices to consider the case where the length of gamma is one. And this third condition, well, that's something we'll come to in, uh, in the proof. That's something we'll return to. So let me step over here to the, the last board. Okay. So the question is, how does one obtain an optimal second parameter in Lorentz spaces? If you think about getting a, a second parameter in the Lorentz space and you want to get an optimal one, uh, the answer is, is that you can obtain an optimal second parameter by interpolation, which is to say that if you can establish, say, a subcritical estimate, which is to say I alpha gamma dot H1 restricted to gamma in the space L1 comma infinity, that's the, the weak L1 space, can be bounded by some constant c. If you can establish a supercritical estimate, which is to say i alpha gamma dot h1 restricted to gamma in Lp infinity is less than c, then you can interpolate. And so I should clarify, why do I say subcritical? Why do I say supercritical? Subcritical is because 1 is less than d over d minus alpha. This is the exponent at which the LP norm or, or even weak LP norm of this scaling will be have, have the right scaling. It'll be linear. This is below the natural exponent, so I call it subcritical. If you look here, this P, and you look at what D over D minus alpha is, this P is some P which is strictly bigger than P over D over D minus alpha, and this P happens to be D minus 1 over D minus 1 minus alpha. And so here you see uh, if d equals 1, then this, this is not going to work. There's other reasons you can't handle the case d equals 1. So if we can establish that one has the subcritical estimate and one has the supercritical estimate, the estimate uh, below the natural exponent and above the natural exponent, even though you take the, the weak type, so you take 1 comma infinity, so this is worse than an L1 estimate. This is worse than this LP estimate. In between, you can recover something which is better than the, uh, than the LD over D minus alpha estimate. You can get the optimal second parameter. Now you might ask, 
if we can prove these two estimates for curves, uh, why can't we do this for general divergence free measures? And the issue here is these estimates are not linear. And so if you establish this estimate for these curves, and then you try to establish the estimate for general divergence free functions, divergence free measures, then uh, you're not going to be able to apply Smirnov's approximation and put things back together. And so then the question that arises is what do you gain? What do you gain by working with closed loops? So with regard to one, what do you gain? With regard to one, the reality is, is that a closed loop has surfaces which span it, which is to say that if you look at gamma dot H1 restricted to gamma, which is the, uh, the integration uh, around it. So if you integrate with respect to this, then you're going to integrate around the, uh, the boundary. Uh, Stokes theorem tells us this is the same as integrating the curl of if we introduce a surface with a normal, the curl of the normal on any surface which spans it. So you take any surface which spans gamma and you integrate over that surface, you integrate the curl of the normal. Uh, this is the same as integrating uh, the, against a, a test function, that same test function integrated around the boundary. And this, uh, this comes into play that when you write down gamma dot H1 restricted to gamma, and you use just the formula that I wrote down for the Reese potential. So you write down it's, it's the integral of the constant times the integral from, one, uh, from zero to infinity. So you go zero to one. And you just leave what's going on between zero and one. And bring in the absolute value. And then you have plus the integral from one to infinity of the same thing. Between one and infinity, what you want to do is you want to take the curve, take the loop, and write it as the curl of, of the normal, and then move the curl in the convolution off of this object and onto PT. So what you can do is you can say this is the curl of PT convolved with NH2 restricted to S. Let me erase and uh, we'll just keep it there a second. Let me erase and make sure I have enough space. So this is plus the integral from one to infinity of t to the alpha over two minus one. And then you have the curl of PT convolved with the normal H2 restricted to the surface and dt. You took the derivative of the heat kernel. When you take the derivative of the heat kernel, that changes the scaling. And so you need to introduce a t to the one half in front to make sure that this is behaving like the heat kernel. You take a derivative in, in space, this is like t to the one half, it, it's the right scaling. And so then you need to introduce also a t to the minus one half because you can't just, you know, just add zero, add, add one, multiply by one in the inequality. And the gain that you find here is that now t to the alpha over two minus one minus a half is integrable at infinity for alpha between zero and one. So this is integrable at infinity, so you can get a pointwise bound by some constant times the supremum of this, so the soup over t bigger than zero of pt convolved with gamma dot h1 restricted to gamma, and the soup of the second. And let's just say that we throw in the whole derivative. So we'd have t to the one half, the gradient of pt convolved with this measure, which is the Hausdorff measure restricted to the surface for any one of these surfaces. So you get this pointwise inequality that the Reese potential of a loop can be controlled by uh, this maximal function uh, acting on the loop plus this maximal function acting on the surface. And now you see that if you make an estimate of this left-hand side, so this is pointwise, so when you put it into the weak L1 space, the fact that you have this pointwise estimate means up to uh, a new constant, you can bound it by the weak L1 norm of this plus the weak L1 norm of that. Because this maximal function is bounded from L1 into weak L1 or from the space of measures into the weak L1. So this is controlled by a constant times the L1 norm of the curve, which is just 
the length of it. It's just integration along that with respect to the, the absolute value of gamma dot. For the second one, you're maybe not used to seeing this maximal function, but you have the gradient of PT and a T to one half. This scales in the right way that this is also a, a bounded maximal function. In fact, the boundedness of both of these, you can, you, you can deduce from the boundedness of the Hardy-Little maximal function from L1 into weak L1 and extended to, from the, the space of measures into, into weak L1 so that you get a bound by the, uh, the measure of this object. So plus H2 of S for any choice of, of surface. So you see where alpha and zero one enters in. And now you are free to choose the surface. So what you have is this is gamma, but the measure of the surface, if you choose a surface, which is, uh, which is a minimal surface, something with zero mean curvature, then you can choose a surface for which this is gonna be controlled by a constant times, well, it won't be gamma because the surface grows uh, quadratically and, and gamma grows linearly. So it has to be a constant times gamma squared. But then you use the fact that we've assumed we're in the case where gamma is equal to gamma squared is equal to one. So the fact that you have length one, you've rescaled by dilation, you can say that this is controlled by some universal constant and we've established the subcritical estimate. So now we can turn our attention to two. Let me just go here and take a look at the time. Yes, this is good. Okay. So for two, for two, what do we have? We have the same thing in which we take the Reese potential and this time, we're gonna break it up into two pieces. We're gonna go from zero to R. And for the initial piece, we do the same thing. We just bring in the modulus here. And for the second piece, integrate from R to infinity, we have this T to the alpha over two minus one. I'm gonna put minus D minus one over two. I'm gonna put a T to the D minus one over two and then I'm gonna write back in what we have here. So I've introduced here this factor of T and I've introduced this factor of T to the, to the opposite exponent. So I multiply by one again, I haven't changed it. And the assumption we're in is that this is bounded by some universal constant C. So this is bounded. This is bounded and this bound and an optimization in R allows us to show that this quantity can be pointwise bounded by a constant times the soup over t of the same maximal function as before to the power one over p where p is as before d minus one over d minus one minus alpha and now if you have this bound you see immediately that i alpha gamma dot h1 restricted to gamma in LP comma infinity is less than this in LP comma infinity. And so the P and the one over P cancel. So it's just the weak L1 norm of this maximal function right here. But this maximal function is bounded on weak L1. So we can get this controlled by a constant times the length of gamma and the length of gamma is one. And so that shows us that if we can uh, restrict ourselves to the case, if we can restrict ourselves to the case where alpha is in zero, which is no problem, that gamma has length one, which is no problem, and we have the boundedness, the uniform boundedness of this object, then we're done. And so it only remains to explain this condition and why we can expect it or how we can obtain this condition. So actually, this is maybe the, the, the difficult point is generically, this condition is not satisfied by loops. If you take a loop and you start off with a single loop and, uh, and you use Smirnov's approximation, or at least the way that we implement Smirnov's approximation, um, you, uh, you did a bad thing because a single loop is not a problem. You can actually do the explicit computation for a single loop. But when you use Smirnov's approximation, what happens in the approximation is you approximate this loop by loops that are gonna go around and they're gonna be round and around. So you'll take a single loop and you'll approximate it with a small coefficient by something that keeps going around. And of course, actually the lengths of them go to infinity in the approximation. So you're gonna cover that a lot of times. And 
This object right here, this scaling t to the d minus one over two, pt can evolve with this. What this actually counts locally on this is the multiplicity. So you got something that counts the multiplicity and you have objects coming up in which basically the multiplicity could be arbitrarily large. This quantity here is, uh, is scale invariant with respect to length. So what you can do is you can take something of length one and you can coil it very tightly like this and you can produce something for which this is arbitrarily large and so this estimate totally falls apart. But you're not so disappointed in this. And the reason is, is because if you come in across this problem, then what you do is you follow it around once and you get a loop and then you say, okay, that's a loop. And then you follow it around again and you get another loop and then you follow it around again and you get another loop and you keep going as, as these loops. And so if you happen to, to, uh, to come across this problem and you have some original loop, which is gamma dot H1 restricted to gamma, and you can write it as the sum of some gamma i dot h1 restricted to gamma. And you can do it in such a way that the quantity that you want, which is the multiplicity here, well, not exactly the multiplicity, but in this example, the multiplicity, stays bounded by some universal constant. If you can write it as the sum in this way, then you're done because then what you do is you come across a loop like this and you break it up into the sum of these loops, which is this equality here. You apply the estimate, which applies to each loop because you have this condition because they don't bunch up on, on each other. And then the sum of the lengths is equal to the sum of the length and then you're done. Um, but maybe uh, we shouldn't say that because maybe this is a very lucky example in which you get this, this property. In fact, it doesn't have to even cover itself. It could be worse than this. You could have an example in which it never touches itself, but it coils and then goes back up. And you could have this coiling, you know, as tightly as you want. And so you say this example doesn't work the way this example was. Yes, you can think about it. You can think about doing something. You can, you can, but you can't be so clean as to have the length of the original equal to the sum of the lengths. But what you can do is if you look here, and if you look at two places that are, that are close uh, in Euclidean space, but not close geodesically, if you connect them with a line segment, which means you, you integrate along the line segment in the one direction, and you connect them with another line segment, and you go and do that every place here, then what you can end up with is you can end up cutting it up into pieces in which you get essentially little loops here, and maybe a big loop like this. Or another example, is if you have something which is coming close to itself, and this is really the problem, is, is if the curve locally will be fine, but if it gets close to itself where it's not close geodesically, then you need to do something. And if you go and you were to insert little segments here, one segment in the one direction and one segment in the other direction, here and there, here and there, here and there, then you would write it as the sum of this loop and this loop and this loop and this loop and then the middle loop, in such a way that you obtain this property that the integration along the original curve is the integration along the new curves. You can enforce this property by making sure whenever it gets close, you don't have that problem. And all you really need is not additivity, but that your new loops don't contribute more than twice the total length. So, you know, some factor of two. And once you can do this, then you're done. Why? because you start off and you're proving this fractional integration theorem for a function which is divergence free. And you apply the approximation result of Smirnov. By the result of Smirnov, you should look at the inequality for loops. Looking at the inequality for loops, if you can apply a procedure in which you take any loop for which this is, uh, this is bad and you replace it with a sum of loops for which this has a uniform bound by some number that you choose, and for which the total length of what you cut it into is not more than twice the total length, then you can apply the result to each of the individual loops. You can recover the length of the loop of Smirnov. And then finally, by Smirnov's approximation, you can recover the original inequality. And so it suffices to prove a lemma like this. And this is, uh, this is the technical point of our section four of our paper in which we have a construction for how to do this. And actually the construction is a little bit more general you can take a single curve and you can write it as the sum of curves.
for which the length is at most one plus epsilon times the original length. But if you go one plus epsilon, then this constant blows up like one over epsilon. Because of course your original curve may not have that property. So if you're gonna go back to your original curve, you're not gonna maintain that property. So this establishes the, uh, the proof of uh, the fractional integration theorem. And the fractional integration theorem, let me come back to the center here. The proof of the fractional integration theorem by uh, these inequalities right here imply the proof of the open question uh, or the, the uh, affirming the validity of the conjecture open question of organic disease. And with that, um, I, I've said what I want to say. So thank you very much for your attention. Okay. Thank you so much. This is one of the sad things in a, in a webinar that you cannot ha hear clapping the other attendees. Um, but nevertheless, thank you for this beautiful talk and explaining it so detailed. Let me turn to the attendees. Are there any questions? Please raise your hand and I can give you permission to speak. Okay, so far is no question there, but I have one uh, uh, question, for instance, uh, you computed everything in R3, is it right? That's right. And that's because of the special uh, construction, the Smirnoff approximation was your main tool and the assumptions, the hypothesis is there that you have to work somehow with loops. And, uh, um, but do you think there is any possibility to do it also in higher dimension? Oh, of course. So I, I work in R3 because this is, first of all, uh, what I experience is reality. <laughs> um, but uh, if, you, um, if you look at what's going on here and you wanna do it outside of R3, uh, of course, this theorem right here is not in three dimensions. This fractional integration theorem is a statement about divergence-free fields. So the fractional integration theorem is okay. The approximation result of Smirnov you actually have in any number of dimensions, I think you should be in at least two dimensions for it to make sense. In two dimensions, actually, it's a little bit easier because in two dimensions being uh, divergence-free or curl-free, you can, you can translate. And so you can just think about these things as sets of finite perimeter. But in, in any number of dimensions, it's okay. Actually, the approximation of Smirnov is much more general. I've seen a result of, um, I think, Paolini and Stepanov that do decompositions of uh, divergence-free vector fields in uh, in metric in metric spaces so oh, okay in fact yeah in okay. fact it's very general i see okay because my next question was actually is a smirnov approximation the only possible way to obtain this or would there be other because how did you find actually this approximation or is it quite natural to use it so uh the story behind this approximation is uh that smirnov was having a conversation this is a story i heard that smirnov had a conversation with borgan and he told him about it. And Borgan then wrote this in the paper that him and, uh, and Heim Brzees had written. And it's written in the paper. But if you look at the paper of Smirnov, which is actually not what I wrote down, it actually says, so the result of Smirnov says the following. It says that um, a divergence-free field has a measure and how it uh, pairs with a continuous function with values in RD. This can be written as integration over curves of length L of each of these curves of length L acting on the same phi with respect to some measure on the space of curves of length L. I see. And a couple more properties, but you start here and then you have to realize is that you can take an integral and you can approximate it by not exact, not a Riemann sum, but using a probabilistic approach, you can make an approximation of this integral by a discrete sum. The curves are not closed at the moment. The curves uh, have length L and by sending L to infinity and using the fact that your F is a measure, so it has, say it has compact support, then the endpoints stay within some compact set and then it's fine. Um, and what you can then do is you connect the endpoints. And so then you can say, using this construction, actually this construction we, we've written up in a, uh, 
a note that we're going to put on the archive in, uh, in the next week or two that says you can actually come to this result, which of course for Smirnov and for Borgan may be, may be obvious. <laughs> um, but one thing that's interesting about this is once you have uh, the approximation by uh, closed loops in the weak star topology, and then you also get this strict convergence, it says that if you have a divergence-free measure, and now it doesn't need to have compact support, you have a divergence-free measure, you can approximate it, first of all, by, by these functions. So before you take the limit, this has compact support. So by taking this function right here, for a given value of L, and by mollifying it, this actually gives you a construction that you can take a given F, which is divergence free, and, uh, and is a measure, and you can approximate it by smooth, compactly supported test functions. Mm -hmm. And I know in the Sobolev case, you know, you have a W11 function, and you, know, you multiply by a cutoff and it's fine, but these are divergence free functions. You can't multiply by cutoffs and maintain the divergence free property. I don't know how to approximate a measure by smooth, compactly supported functions outside of it. So I thought that was something else that was, was interesting that comes up here. Okay, interesting. It's very interesting. So, so somehow the, the question about the, this approximation was actually yeah, pushed forward by Bourguin and Precis through Smirnov. Okay, and then you follow that, this. That's idea, right. Actually. Okay. That's right. Good. Okay, are there other questions, please? Yeah, yeah. So Yoshikatsu has a question. He has, uh, he can speak now. Yes. Uh, does your method also conclude similar estimate for other operators like core? Today you, you are talking about divergence free. Mm -hmm. right? But does your method also works for car free vector field? So if you look at the uh, the reverse of the system that the curl is zero and the divergence is rho. Yeah. In that specific case, I have counterexamples, of course, because uh -huh. if, um, if you're looking at that, you're looking at solving like the Poisson equation for an L1 and rho has, has, no, has mm -hmm. no nice properties. And so you could concentrate. So you, the best you can do is maybe weak L1. But there, there are the possibility to do this for other operators. If you actually look at elliptic and canceling operators, which are the, the class that uh, Jean Manchapkin, or in this case, maybe it should be co-canceling. I have to think. You have a fractional integration theorem, mm -hmm. and I believe that there's a paper that has just appeared on archive that may be able to handle the case of things that are uh, more general than divergence-free. So after we came out with this, I've, I've seen a new paper, and, and I'm very eager to check the, this is a, a result of Stolyarov, which looks very interesting. Uh -huh. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sure, my pleasure. You. Thank you. Other questions? Are there other questions? Well, if not, uh, so we, I will close now the seminar. It's already 4 p.m. in uh, Sydney, Canberra, and Melbourne. So um, everybody of you has should have received an invitation to the coffee break and uh, uh, please join us now. We will continue there with your favorite drink and where we will have also some uh, informal conversations, but you can of course also raise questions to the, uh, to the talk. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, thank you again, Daniel, for this nice talk and uh, we hope to see you again. Okay, bye. Thank you, Daniel. Bye-bye.